Hello, my name is Nicholas Morgan and I'm an editor at Avo All News and this is Turkey Abroad. Joining me now is an expert from the from the RAND organization, John Parancini. John, welcome aboard. Nice to be with you. So the United States has finally moved ahead with sanctioning Turkey for its purchase of the Russian S-400 missile system under the Katsa, Katsa sanctions. And these sanctions were aimed at the Turkish defense sector, particularly the head of its defense industry and a few executives who were involved in the purchase. But some analysts are mixed in the ultimate effectiveness of these sanctions because they appear more symbolic than actually punitive. Is this the right way to think about how effective this move is? What is your view on this? Well, sanctions uh, always have multiple functions and they're certainly uh, symbolic. It's a way that a country expresses its disenchantment with another uh, country or individual or entity, but they can also have more than symbolic effects. And there are financial implications here in these sanctions, as well as aspects of how these sanctions are implemented that may retard industrial development. Uh, these sanctions uh, have been uh, clear as a possibility uh, for several years, and the United States and Turkey have engaged in an ongoing dialogue about uh, what the United States saw as a threat uh, if Turkey were to purchase and activate the Russian S-400 system, and immediately, uh, once it did so, took action to remove Turkey from a uh, from the F-35 fighter jet program, that will in itself have implications for Turkey. Turkey has made enormous strides in recent years uh, in, in terms of its economic development and in particular its development of advanced weapons. Uh, being removed from the F-35 program will have implications. And that is something that occurred long before the CATSA sanctions were applied. Now, with the Katsa sanctions uh, imposed on the um, Turkish acquisition uh, or military acquisition organization and several of its senior leaders, that has less of an impact. It's more symbolic, but indeed those individuals are now prohibited from visiting the United States, from receiving loans. If they have assets in the United States, those assets are frozen. Uh, the sanctions also uh, prohibit US entities from loaning money to the Turkish defense sector and from exporting technology to uh, the Turkish de defense sector. So it's a combination. There is both uh, symbolic diplomatic measures uh, as well as things with real implications. In, on, on the spectrum of highly punitive to not so punitive, these are probably a midpoint and it leaves open the possibility for an ongoing dialogue between two important allies, the United States and Turkey. How this gets resolved uh, will be a matter for diplomatic discussions in the Biden administration. And uh, I think the uh, Trump administration has kind of left the door open for that dialogue to ensue. You, you, start, you started talking about how, uh, the strides that Turkey's made in trying to develop their own military capabilities. And one point that President Erdogan has emphasized across the years has been the independence of the Turkish defense sector or the, what he, the goal of complete independence from uh, the defense sector. But Turkey still remains pretty dependent on the United States for a lot of military equipment from components to munitions. So do you, do you think that it, the sanctions will ultimately Reduce, slow down Turkey's goal of trying to achieve that kind of independence? How, what, what do you think the implications for that agenda might be with these sanctions? Well, uh, Turkey is a NATO ally and all NATO allies have collaborated on arms development. There's an interoperability uh, for all the NATO allies in, in their weaponry how it's used, how it's maintained, and that's really important. That helps make the NATO alliance a strong alliance. And there are economies of scale there. And I think all allies uh, benefit from the alliance in terms of those economy of scales and reduce costs 
to its own national economy. I think that's an important element for Turkish leaders to take into account because Turkey's economy has been so successful in the last decade and a half is what risks is it now taking to develop its own non-aligned weapons procurement posture that it might end up diverting lots of national resources to develop an indigenous defense capability that are not available to advance Turkey's civilian economy, which has been so important to the well-being uh, of uh, Turkish citizens. So I think in the short run, there'll be limited effect, but over the long run, if this is not resolved, it will have implications for uh, Turkish uh, defense equipment. And just turning to alternative sources for, uh, from Russia or China will be stopgap measures because they'll have to develop whole new maintenance lines to maintain those types of weapons, which means of the weapons that they have from Western countries, from NATO allies, they'll have to duplicate the whole maintenance structure. But you can't just take the maintenance structure for NATO equipment and use it for Russian or Chinese equipment. They require their own maintenance lines, thus increasing the cost. And remember, the important thing is when you get a weapon system, you pay an initial cost, right? That's the sticker price, but over seven years, the maintenance of that equipment equals the sticker price. So an important thing is always to be thinking about what's the long-term cost here and how do I really achieve the security my country needs with weapons, diplomacy, a strong economy, and the um, beauties and influence of our culture. I think in Turkey's case, it's, its culture, its economy has been very important uh, in the alliance of NATO countries, but also in the South Caucasus region. I read a report re recently actually about the, these costs involved where when Turkey, when Turkey would import their equipment fr from the United States or countries in Western Europe, some of the, these costs were also included in the initial payment that was made. Whereas in the case of the Russian deal, there was no equivalent. And on top of it, one of Turkey's main gripes was that they couldn't get the necessary technology transferred for when they attempted to purchase the Patriot. But there was also a report in Russian media some time ago that said Turkey did not receive, the tech, they only received the partial technology transfer even for the S-400 because almost ironically at this point, the Russians distrusted Turkey as a NATO ally to protect that technology. So it does seem, it does seem to have just highlighted again the political nature of this deal and it doesn't really seem to bolster turkey defense that much um at least on those grounds for the s for 100. uh so this is an important point you're making and it's a complicated arrangement anytime a country purchases weapons from either an ally or another nation and thinking through what those maintenance costs will be over time is important in many cases, Russia requires the maintenance to be done back in Russia itself. So it's not as though you would develop a maintenance line in Turkey that would employ people uh, because the equipment would be taken back to Russia to be maintained there by Russian, uh, tech, uh, by Russian uh, maintenance uh, personnel. This is complicated and it's expensive. And a lot of Western NATO equipment is expensive sometimes more expensive than the Russian equipment, but it's important to think through the cost over the long haul. Now you also raised the question about can Turkey develop its own indigenous defense production capability? And Turkey has done that to a fairly considerable extent. I think in the short run, uh, it will um, face trouble uh, by trying to build up its own indigenous capability because it takes time to do that. It takes expertise. Over the long run, it may do so. But the question is, what's the amount of national capital that it's gonna have to invest to do that? And in some cases, it may be worth to do that, particularly in areas that have dual use civilian application. Uh, that I think is an important policy decision where technology development that might be relevant for military purposes might also be applied in other spheres 
of a country's national economy, such as in the medical field or civilian aviation uh, or in uh, industrial production uh, of all sorts of capital goods. Of course, of course, when we were talking about the COTSA sanctions too, the goal was to, deter, of course, continue to deter purchases from the Russian defense sector. And I want to, I, I want to ask you because they, a lot of the comparisons actually being made right now is between, at least in Turkish media and others, is between, say, Turkey and India or Turkey and a few other non-NATO allies that are still in the process of purchasing equipment, including the S-400. So, John, what I what I want to ask you is, what is the what is the real impact on this goal of preventing ru purchases from Russia of this equipment? Do you think that putting sanctions on Turkey, a NATO ally, was effective in deterring some of these other non-NATO countries that the United States is aligned with from going through with that further? Yeah, a very good question. Look, each country. Uh, faces its own unique geopolitical circumstances. And other countries, seeing what the United States has um, imposed upon Turkey for its purchase of the S-400 air defense system after several years of negotiation and alternatives provided, every country will now have to see this as a potentially complicating factor when it is considering purchasing Russian weapons. Uh, the United States is, is watching carefully uh, Russian arms sales around the globe. And let's remember the point of these sanctions are not to punish a country like Turkey or other countries that seek to meet their national defense needs, but rather to send both a, a political and financial signal to Russia that its invasion in, in 2014 of Crimea its military operations in support of irregular forces in Eastern Ukraine, its interference in the US uh, 2016 election, and indeed its current cyber attack that has been going on here in the United States since March of 2020, is, uh, should be penalized. That's the behavior of a state in the international system that's violating the norms and laws that the international community of states generally follow. So the whole point of these sanctions is to deny Russia revenue for military sales that it can use for conducting these other malign activities around the globe. These are secondary sanctions, so they're not applied to Russia per se. There are other sanctions that are applied to Russia, other freezing of Russian assets, but these are trying to discourage countries from buying Russian weapons, which just puts more money into the Russian coffers that they can use for malign activities. So it's trying to get Russia's attention, but also trying to get other countries to recognize that the way that you curb the behavior of a state that is breaking international law and international norms is you, you don't buy from it. Now, in terms of other countries, think about it, particularly India. Uh, again, every country is set in its own geopolitical circumstances. India has had a long-term relationship with both the Soviet Union before Russia and Russia thereafter, where a lot of its arsenal is legacy equipment from Russia. So it can't totally switch over to French or Turkish or, or American systems overnight, although it has been decreasing its purchase of Russian equipment, has increased from other countries, Israel among them, uh, and is making some transition. But uh, China or uh, India finds itself in an exchange with China now. And so turning to Russia for weapons uh, is a natural because it really can't turn to its adversary China, which is what a number of countries have done. But uh, the United States and India remain in an active dialogue on weapons purchases uh, from Russia. And that's really the point of these sanctions. It's trying to discourage countries from purchasing these weapons, not to penalize them, but to discourage them from doing so and to start a diplomatic dialogue. Are there alternative weapon systems, not just American weapon systems, but other countries that a country could purchase weapons from in order to meet its security needs? Or are there other measures, diplomatic measures that it could draw upon to change its security situation? 
just reaching for uh, weapons to defend yourself is not the only way to achieve security. If you could find diplomatic measures to offset the threat, that might be at a much lower cost and have more enduring value. Where if you just have to arm to fight, uh, that could break down at any time and is very expensive. Sticking very quickly to to um, the on the weapons issue, um, you, we we both were brought up India, and um, for the the reason why it seems like it was brought up a lot in comparison to Turkey in this case was because uh, Turkey was complaining that they do not get access to the technology to the Patriot, thus they bought the S four hundred. They didn't receive a waiver to acquire the equipment, uh, say the S four hundred. Um, but India. They, the U.S. has been gravitating more towards India as part of the, um, the growing competition with China, of course, and India was able to receive both um, an agreement related to technology transfer and um, they were a waiver for the S-400. And it does, see, it does seem um, there's some incongruency there where um, Turkey as a member of NATO is being penalized in the mind of Turkey but then a country that's of interest to the United States and, and a great power in its own right, India, is then getting everything that Turkey, who's again been part of NATO for a long period of time, is not getting. What do you? How do you explain that? Yeah. So first, uh, the the point about Turkey being a NATO ally is an important one, and you would think that allies would collaborate for their mutual defense, and Turkey has sort of gone out of its way to not do so in this instance. Uh, there's kind of a neo-Ottoman approach by the current Turkish government that is uh, playing major powers, uh, showing that it has independence and can um, be aligned with major powers in, in different ways. It, it, it's uncertain how this will play out because Turkey has been on the opposite side of conflicts with Russia in Libya, Syria, Nagorno-Karabakh, so it's, it's a dangerous tightrope that uh, Turkey is pursuing in this neo-Ottoman uh, policy. But the point about being an ally is you work together and you, by working together, you reduce costs. And so by pursuing the S-400 as opposed to other alternatives, which could have been an American air defense system or others that might be available, uh, Turkey has essentially taken on a bigger cost. India, in contrast, has this is is not a uh, is a a friend but not a formal ally. Although there's an attempt to develop a a quad arrangement uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, but India has long-standing military relations with Russia, so it's kind of a unique case, and that's why I say. Each country sits in its own unique geopolitical circumstance. Turkey and the United States are allied in NATO. That should give it special relationship to work things out as opposed to go it alone in a new uh, policy approach where India and the United States are emerging friends. And there may be areas where we agree and where we disagree uh, but it is not an alliance relationship like the special one we have with NATO and all our NATO members like Turkey. The, uh, moving to, from the S-400 over into another system that's gained a lot of notoriety with Turkey are the, the armed drones that Turkey's been using in its conflicts in Nagorno-Karabakh or Libya or in Syria. And it, it almost, it, it's an interesting kind of case where the Russians are always insisting on the effectiveness or the dominance of their air defense systems, including the S-400, but they've been defeated or they've been defeated in multiple cases by Turkish drones, whether it was inside of Syria where the S-400 was located or other Russian systems further away in other countries where the two of them have backed opposite sides. So what, what do you think is the cause of this um, advantage that Turkey's had over these Russian systems. Do you think it's a superiority of technology or tactics? Why is it that the Russian systems have been falling short against, say, Turkish air power in these in these theaters? Well, again, it's a it's a complex of factors. Um, first of all, even though the S four hundred is a very sophisticated air defense system, a 
high altitude air defense system. Making it effective requires a highly skilled workforce to operate it. And it requires lots of other components really to be networked in. It's not just a standalone system. It needs an ability to defend itself to be defended, but it also needs an ability to track things coming in and a number of other air defense systems that the Russians have provided uh, to Syria or in Libya uh, were not near as sophisticated as the either the S-300 or the S-400, uh, but it shows the new way of warfare. Turkey has developed some fairly sophisticated drones. Uh, the new way of warfare is you can use unmanned systems that are less expensive and use them uh, in large numbers, and they overwhelm even the best air defense systems. Look at what happened in Saudi Arabia, which uh, was attacked uh, by missiles on their, you know, missiles attacked their oil fields. There were uh, air defense systems in Saudi Arabia, but it's just very difficult to be effective against low and slow flying drones that can be precision targeted and can uh, evade the capabilities of air defense systems. They evade it by either jamming it with electronic warfare, by swarming it, by coming underneath it. Uh, it's, it's just a very complicated new era in warfare. You, you also you mentioned the electronic warfare element in there too. And I've, I've read reports about, um, it's, it's an area of the Turkey's been developing itself in a lot also j just without as much fanfare as you might see them put out there for the drones. And it seems like that was a pretty big factor, at least in Syria, where of course on top of it, there's the geographical, geographical uh, proximity of those two theaters, which might have given Turkey some advantages. But is electronic warfare another place where you, you see any de significant developments on Turkey's part? Well, I think, um many countries are watching carefully Turkey's involvement in Syria, then its involvement in Libya, then its involvement in Nagorno-Karabakh. And taking lessons away from what they see. And I think the, elect the surveillance, target identification, jamming air defense systems is important, but in many cases, particularly in Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh, even those elements did not come into play. It just is the drones with uh, precision guided musician, uh, munitions that are able to overwhelm the area shows that armored ground forces are just not enough when there's no air defense against armed drones. Mm -hmm. So the, you, you mentioned that Turkey's um, changed, changed some of the game when it comes to drone warfare, which of course is sent, almost sent a piece to today's, today's uh, forms of warfare. And what if, what, what if Turkey's campaigns in Syria and Nagorno-Karabakh or elsewhere, what, what, what are the best lessons that we can take away from the way that they've applied drone forces and other measures against um, you know, sophisticated adversary or proxy adversary like those in Syria or Libya, what are the most important lessons to take away from all this? Well, uh, one important uh, lesson is the importance of drones and effective air defense. And it's difficult to make air defense effective because you have to have a highly trained workforce, you have to have very good radar, you have to understand how to bring it all together. It's really a system of systems to make air defense effective. But if you do that, it does degrade the effectiveness of drones. But the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh was not just a technology fight. Uh, Turkey also employed Syrian mercenaries. And so they had uh, not only an overwhelming, the uh, Azerbaijan not only had the assistance of Turkey for an overwhelming air superiority, but it also had uh, an additional force of mercenaries that were paid to come and fight, and that increased the personnel on the ground for Azerbaijan. So um, military technology is an important part of it, but so is the human element. And whether the human element is on the attack side or on the operating defense side, 
you have to take it into account. John, it was great to have you on Turkey Abroad. It was, it's a, this is a topic that's of great interest to a lot of our listeners and readers. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to join me today. It was my pleasure to be with you. My name is Nicholas Morgan, and this is Turkey Abroad.